Uh, the book of Joshua shows us Israel crossing the river Jordan and entering in and possessing the land that they had been promised by the Eternal. It provides us with the details of the taking of the land, inhabiting of the land, and the people of that land. Now, the book is named after the principal character the Eternal had used to lead the people at the time. There was a number of great lessons, brethren, that in this book, of course, which relate to the followers of Christ, to us. One important point in the book of Joshua is courage. Now, literally, the first command to Joshua was that he was to be courageous. In Joshua chapter 1, the Eternal told Joshua in verse 6, Joshua 1 verse 6, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Now, courage, brethren, is a necessary ingredient that Joshua was commanded to have. Verse 7, only be strong and be very courageous, though this is repeated, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. So he talked about the importance of the book of the law and how it was to not depart you know, to, from your mouth. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For when you will make your way prosperous, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So these are the consequences. You will accomplish what the Eternal is offering to you. And verse 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So a third time we see the Eternal reiterated the need to be strong and of good courage. Now, let us read the end of the book of Joshua. Joshua at this point, verse, that's verse 1 of chapter 23. Joshua at this point was coming to the end of his days. And the land had been divided, the tribes had been established in their homeland. So we read in verse 1, Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua was old, advanced in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, and for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, and for their, own, for their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you, for the Lord your God is he, who has fought for you? See, I have divided you, divided to you by lot these nations that remain, to be an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan, with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight, so you shall possess their land as the Lord your God promised you. So, brethren, there was still work to be done. You know, parts of the land, they had to be conquered and those parts of the land had to be inherited. Among the very last words that Joshua told the leaders were the words he had been instructed many years before as he stood and examined the task before him. Verse 6, Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. So you see, brethren, it takes courage to be committed to the task which is set out for us in terms of the book of law. Verse 7, Unless you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. Now, you know, they could... You know, look back and remember all the events that the Eternal had provided for them during that period of time. He was telling them the lessons that had been so important and conveyed to him, to Joshua, by the Eternal at the start of the book. Now let us go back to the start of the book. The second point is that the Eternal was present with them all the time in this book. You know, he never departed from the house of Israel. He is there, brethren, either verbally or personally. Joshua chapter 1, and let us go and read verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. In other words, God was saying, you have got this responsibility. 
I'm here to help, I'm here to encourage and give you deliverance. So Joshua instructed the priests to take up the ark to prepare to cross the river Jordan. Joshua chapter 3, verse 7. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the ark of the covenant, saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. So you see, the Eternal was instructing Joshua personally in a remarkable manner. In chapter 4, we find another account of Joshua being instructed by the Eternal in the first three verses of chapter 4. In chapter 5, the Eternal instructs Joshua to have the people circumcised three days prior to the Passover. In chapter 6, verse 27, which we are going to read, the Eternal instructs them regarding how they are to go about the conquering of Jericho. And it says, So the Lord was with Joshua, again, the Lord is there personally or in word, and his fame spread throughout all the country. So God was personally there with Joshua. Joshua understood that he had an incredible support system with him and his fame spread throughout all the country. Of course, the people were disquieted because of it. And after the defeat of Ai, Joshua went in and fell on his face before the Eternal. And the Eternal said in chapter 7, verse 10, So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Why do you lie thus on your face? In other words, there is something wrong. You know, can't you work that out? So chapter after chapter, we have many occasions where the Eternal is in communication with Joshua personally, almost on a face-to-face -face basis. In chapter 5, verse 13 through 15, Joshua meets the Eternal as he appears before him. Joshua 5, verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Well, you know, this is who I am. You know, And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. And there is, you see, a very personal relationship here between Joshua and the Eternal. Verse 15, Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Well, brethren, we have just read excerpts from the first few chapters of the book. We could also go to the end of the book, and what would we find? Well, again, the Eternal is always there with them. He is always available to them, to strengthen them, to give them help, and to encourage, direct, and correct them when necessary. So the presence of, an, of the Eternal is another great facet of the book of Joshua. The third facet is the aspect of faith. And next Sabbath we'll spend some time about the speaking about the faith. Well, when the crossing of the river Jordan occurred in chapter 3 and verse 8, Joshua 3 verse 8, You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Israel crossed on dry land, just like the Red Sea. But there was another ingredient involved in the crossing of the river Jordan. So we find that as the people assemble, the priests and the Ark are assembled. So in verse 11 of Joshua 3, And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So you see, the priests bearing the ark had to be prepared to get their feet wet before the eternal intervened. In Exodus 14, we won't go there, but I'll just remind you, but in Exodus 14, we have an account of Moses and the Israelites, of course. And it tells us that Moses had to take his rod and strike it out over the sea. And the Eternal caused it to miraculously separate before anyone got wet. But on this occasion, you see, people had to step out in faith 
and something was going to happen because God's way is a way of faith. Example after example of faith occurs throughout the chapter, the chapters that follow. Now, a few chapters later, we read about the fall of Jericho. You know, you walk around the city seven days, and on the seventh day, you walk around seven times, and you don't make any noise. Now, what was going through the minds of the Israelites as they circle around that city, you know, day after day? They had to be faithful to the instructions that the Eternal had given. And on the seventh day, they shouted, and Jericho became ruined. Brethren, keep in mind that Jericho at that time was the uh, greatest fortified city in all the world, as far as I remember reading commentaries. And so it was, you know, faith was a requirement for the people of Israel as they entered and possessed the promised land. Now, speaking of faith, we have a wonderful example of the sun standing still or a sudden change in the relationship with the sun to the moon or sun to the earth so that the battle was able to be conducted. It is another great event that was beyond the control of human beings. We don't really know how it could happen, but it was an aspect of faith. The fourth point we can see in Joshua is purity. I mentioned all in chapter 5, Israel had to be circumcised. So it had to be acceptable to the eternal to inhabit the land. Now how was Jericho to be destroyed? It says it was being devoted to the eternal, which meant that it had to undergo a purifying by fire purging by fire. Anything that can survive fire, like gold and precious metals, would become part of the treasury of the tabernacle. Everything else had to be consumed. There was no place for it in terms of the people of Israel. And this is a very important lesson because we find later on that Achan had actually seen a goodly Babylonian, Babylonish garment and several talents of gold and silver and he had hidden them in the midst of his tent. They should have all been subject to the fire as part of the purification of the children of Israel. Achan and his family and all of the, all of the possessions of Achan were also devoted. They all suffered by fire. And so Israel as a host was purged and kept pure before the eternal. Now Achan, the example of Achan, leads us to another topic that appears in the book of Joshua, that of sin. Now Jericho was a type of sin, the type of this world that has to be destroyed before the kingdom of God can be established. Now we might remember how Gibeonites masqueraded as travelers from a distant land who had come to hear and to learn about Joshua and the children of Israel. Joshua did not seek the eternal and the people suffered as a result of it. So sin is a major factor throughout the book. Then there is another aspect in the book, brethren, that of the land itself. Now the land was to be divided among the tribes. And there is the underlying principle that supported everything the Eternal did in the book of Joshua. It was expressed by David in the Psalms and something people so easily forget because, you know, they get something and they think it's theirs and they have an attitude, I can do what I like with it. Well, of course, they cannot do what they like with it. In Psalm 24, verse 1, there is a principle that Israel had to learn, that in fact, brethren, we have to learn for all times. Psalm 24, verse 1. It's a simple verse that you may probably even know. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness the world and those who dwell therein. Well, we can say that we have been given at best a lease hold on the earth because it is eternal's. At any time, the eternal can take it back or use it for his own purposes. Don't think you are someone because you have something. Always remember from where it comes and who has provided it. Something else about the book of Joshua is the fact that the house of Israel was a covenant people. Israelites had to enter, in fact, they entered into a covenant through circumcision. They reiterated the covenant in chapter 8, verse 30 and 35, as they were to do. At the end of the book, Joshua is talking about the covenant once again. Joshua 24. 
In chapter 24, Joshua reiterated the way of the eternal to Israel. And in verse 25. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of, life, in the, book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So here he was talking about the covenant with them. As a covenant people, brethren, what was their responsibility? Well, they took upon themselves a responsibility, and that responsibility was to be a light to the world. As a people living in a covenant relationship with God, they were to preach the gospel to the world. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, uh, that is a scripture that we should well mark in our Bibles, and we should remember that scripture, brethren, always, because it portrays to us what we are supposed to do with the law of God. Nothing has changed. We are supposed to be a light to the nations. The house of Israel, as we well know, never accomplished that. From time to time, there would be a righteous king or a righteous individual who led the people back into a covenant relationship with God, but they were few and far between. Deuteronomy 4, verse 6. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Verse 7. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourselves and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Now Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, in chapter 36, he was inspired to summarize the way in which Israel had conducted itself after they were instructed in Deuteronomy chapter 4. By the time Ezekiel wrote his book, the house of Israel had been in captivity for over a century. Judah was also in captivity, so these people have lived out their lives in the land and had be been removed from the land. And here was the eternal inspiring a prophet to help them understand the reasons that had been, they had been removed. They didn't have the courage to do what they should have done. They were too easily moved aside. They lost faith. Ezekiel 36 verse 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. Verse 23 and 20, 22. Now Deuteronomy chapter 4, brethren, says that the nations are supposed to stand in awe in awe of Israel and say, what a great nation, what a great God these people have. What great statutes and judgments have been given to them. The results of their living according to the law of God and continuing in that covenant would have enabled the name of God to be praised among the Gentiles. Ezekiel says, basically, you conducted yourself in such a way that profaned my name. You brought my name down to the mud and made it of no consequence to people. Even going into captivity, they still profaned the name of their God. Verse 23. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. So God is going to work this out. He's going to bring them back to repentance and enable them to show the nations of the world the way of light that should be lived. He's going to bring them back from the nations and to put a new spirit and a new heart within them, which is a new covenant relationship we are privileged to understand at this point of time, brethren. 
Now Joshua set an example for the people to live. Ezekiel tells us that they did not live according to his example. Now we've got two books of the Bible which parallel the book of Joshua. They contain exactly the same points. Courage, the presence of the eternal, faith, purity, sin, land and covenants. One of those books is the book of Acts. The book of Acts also talks about the church being empowered by God's Holy Spirit and accomplishing what was that they were to do. Courage. In chapter 4 of the book of Acts, we'll find there is courage which follows a great event in chapter 3. Let's see that great event, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Well, you see, brethren, those coming to the temple were coming to actually to worship God, so that meant that they should be you know, merciful to lesser beings and concerned about doing a good deed. So people would obviously give alms. So being at the gate of the temple was a great place because you got the righteous section of the population all at once. There was no use being in the market because the traders may not have any righteousness to them. So by getting a seat at the gate of the temple, you really got the concentration of the good people who should help you. Verse 3, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Well, there was expectation there because a person going into the temple would obviously have something to give alms or to put in the treasury in the temple. So maybe they'll you know, give it to me instead of putting it in the treasury of the temple. That was the thought of those beggars. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Shocking, remarkable event, brethren. Verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And later we read that the man was about 40 years of age and he had been lame from his mother's womb. Well, people who have not walked for a period of time and then have the opportunity of getting up and walking, normally find it very difficult, brethren, to retain their balance. But this man had never learned to walk, so he had no idea of the balance that was involved in walking. Verse 8. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Well, this man was whole, and most importantly, this man was now able to go into the temple and worship the Eternal. Well, of course, that created a stir we find in chapter 4, verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. It was rendering such a stir in the temple because this man gained the ability to walk, run, leap, and above else, praise, praise God. Verse 2, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the member of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. Verse 7, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? And Peter gives a very courageous sermon to them. Verse 9 through 12. Peter was you know, very courageous about the role that he had been given by God. Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rules of the people and elders of Israel, Verse 9, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. 
This is the stone which was rejected by your builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Well, they didn't have John and Peter any rabbinical education, but in those days you find a similar form of snobbery in terms of academics today. If you don't have a PhD, you are not worth talking to because you wouldn't understand. Now these people consider themselves to be the PhDs of their day and anyone who didn't have a PhD was not worth talking to about spiritual things or Bible things or biblical things because it was assumed that they didn't understand the spiritual things, you know. Verse 14, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Dropping to verse 18, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Well, brethren, we are talking about the highest Jewish authority in the land, saying, we are putting a gag order on you. Verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of the God to listen to you more than God, you judge. In other words, they said, that's your problem. Or as he said in verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Well, brethren, what a remarkable courage the disciples had in fulfilling the responsibility they had before them. Verse 21, So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. We are now in chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, verse 16. Also multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So wondrous healings, wondrous deeds being done by the apostles, brethren. Verse 17, that the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. In other words, they were indignated, brethren, because these people are taking away this country away from us. That's what they thought of the apostles. They were taking their control over the people away from them. Verse 18, And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, verse 20, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. So they entered into the temple and did as they had been told. They didn't need any encouragement to do that. Verse 21. And when they heard that they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officer came and did not find them in the prison... They returned and reported, saying, verse 23, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Well, then they heard these guys preaching from the temple. Now, normally, when people escape from custody, they try to get away (laughs) as far as they can from the place where they were incarcerated. And if you can, you know, get a border between, so much the better. Now, these men went into the most public place possible, brethren, because the Sanhedrin was probably meeting in a temple. It was a large place, but still, you know, they were in the temple preaching. Verse 25. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. You know, they didn't try to flee. They were right back doing what they should be doing. They were very much strong in their commitment to the task that had been placed before them. Verse 28, saying, Did we not strictly command you to teach, not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. 
Well, brethren, that was their problem. The apostles were not doing that in any way whatsoever, trying to bring, you know, Jesus Christ's blood on them. Verse 29, however, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Here is our line in the sand. As Peter said, we must obey God, we obey God, not you. Verse 20, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus from whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, of course, what was the result, the end result of that? Fury. Verse 33. When I heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one of the council in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, and a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Now in chapter 12, we find great courage in the face of death as well. Peter and James are put in prison. James is killed and Peter was to be kept until after the days of unleavened bread and then killed. The angel of the eternal woke Peter up in the prison and released him. The church found it challenging to find you know, that Peter was standing at the front door knocking. Acts 12 verse 16. Now Peter con continued knocking and when they opened the door and saw him they were astonished. You see the eternal brethren did not intervene for James the brother of John, the son of Zabedee, who was martyred. But in Peter's case, God did intervene, and here was Peter standing at the door, verse 17. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go, tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Now, on this occasion, of course, it was appropriate for Peter to have a low, lower profile, to be out of sight. And, you know, we could go on to the life of Paul and all that he suffered. Acts chapter 14. What did Paul suffer? Well, being stoned, left for dead. It was sheep, he was shipwrecked. Then when we talked, you know, about the way in which he suffered at Ephesus, he mentions all those ordeals he had. And then time after time, Beaten with rods, stoned, shipwrecked. You see, but the Eternal delivered him out of them all, out of all those troubles. This took courage and the understanding of the presence of the Eternal, the understanding that the Eternal was right there with them. In chapter 4, we find how they came together after they had been before the Sanhedrin. And in verse 23, Acts 4, verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and others had said to them. And then we find in verse 31, And when they had, they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the words of God with boldness. Now, the Eternal was present with them, obviously. Jesus Christ brought the Spirit, you know, through the Spirit, actually, Jesus Christ was there with them. And, you know, he has been and he is with them all throughout this book. We find time and time again the Eternal instructing the apostles as to what they were to do. He was instructing them how they were to go, how they were to proceed. Now, Peter in chapter 10, having a vision so that he would understand the call of Cornelius, and Paul seeing the man from Troas saying, come and help us. Well, the eternal was with them. No wonder, brethren. The angels could release the prisoners and leave the lock as, you know, though it had been untouched. But no one, you know, no one had vandalized. The eternal was with them time and time again. They had to act in faith. Now we have read, we have read in chapter 3, about the healing of the man who was lame from birth we are not starting you know we're not starting with an easy miracle we are starting with everything against you 
This man was lame from his mother's womb, and here the Eternal heals him as a result of the faith of the apostles. We could, you know, look at many examples in which faith was necessary example of their lives, and they had to give themselves in faith to God. We also have an aspect of purity. Now, baptism was a part of the purity for the people to become part of the community. Even this man who was born lame, by being healed, he also became pure so that he could enter the temple and be able to, you know, have a relationship with the eternal, with his God. Now, purity is also an issue for the Gentiles, such as Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. In verse 26, Cornelius is Peter and falls at his feet. But Peter said, Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. I am just a messenger, not one to be worshipped, says Peter. Verse 27, And he talked with him. He went and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man He's speaking to Cornelius, of course, in Cornelius' household. For a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one another of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So he came to learn something about the purity of the Gentiles, brethren, and the way in which God, the Gentiles, could also you know, become pure we find that you know they were able to be baptized and to receive God's Holy Spirit in a profound way. Well, we also find the situation in Antioch, where the civil, you know, where, where, where the church was uh, able to have uh, to have both Gentiles and Jews. So their membership was made up of both Gentiles and Jews in Antioch. And purity. And the understanding of purity in a relationship with God that connects as a result of that purity is an underlying issue even in the book of Acts. What about sin? Well, Achan had a parallel in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 1. The, the first verse, half of chapter 5 deals with Ananias and Sapphira, people who were prepared to sin and the consequences of that sin. They also didn't have a part in the community. Sin is contrary to the community that the eternal is creating. Acts chapter 5 verse 1. But a certain name made, made, name, um, uh, named, a man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold the possession. And he kept the back, back part of the proceeds. His wife also being unaware of it. And brought a certain pearl and laid it at the apostles feet. Now Peter said, you know, you had to make the decision about how much you wanted to give. There is no compulsion on you to give everything. You just don't need to lie about it and make it appear that you were the great magan, magnum, 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 <laughs> great person that, you know, you presented yourself as being. Verse 3, chapter, uh, chapter 5 of Acts, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price for, of the land for yourself? So, you know, you didn't have to give anything, but you couldn't appear, you know, that you were such a great, wonderful person that is present, that will present all, the, uh, you know, present that as, as, as he or she is not. In every case, in any case, the consequence was that both Ananias and his wife died. Now this is a very powerful, brethren, lesson of the consequences of sin. In chapter 30 we see the occasion of Paul and Barnabas being in Cyprus. And we have the sorcerer who is bewitching the king, leading the king astray. Now Paul is able to command, you know, and command that, command that man to be made blind, that one who was a sorcerer, which is a very fitting consequence for this man who is seeking to lead people astray in a very profound way. So sin and the consequences of sin have a very great part to play in this book. In Acts 17, Paul addresses the Athenians 
he talks to them about the way in which all humanity is lost in sin. Acts chapter 17, verse 29 and verse 30. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but you know now commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere to repent. What is repentance? Well, it's turning the other way and going opposite of what you walk to. Now, repentance of itself requires the existence of sin. If there is no sin, there is no need to repent. So every time the apostles are speaking about repenting, it is because of the existence of sin. Now, that is what was on their minds. You know, bringing people back into covenant relationship, is, uh, covenant relationship with their Creator. Now, bringing them into a new covenant relationship. They were driven so by it because it was the calling they had been given. They had the responsibility to preach the gospel to the entire world. And brethren, that is an aspect of the land from earlier on. Now, what is the aspect of land in the book of Acts? Psalm 24, verse 1, I'll remind you, it says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. You see, in Acts chapter 2, we have people coming from almost every part of the globe to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacle, or sorry, for the Feast of Pentecost in this case. Now we find people coming in even from outside the Roman Empire to hear the good news, which is very, very remarkable. So in Acts chapter 8, we have the Ethiopian eunuch coming in probably a 2,500 kilometers journey from whereabouts he lived in Ethiopia, in Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Now, this was even for him, a wealthy man, probably a once in a lifetime event. Now, Paul ended up also in the center of Athens. Then he also ended up later in the center of the Roman Empire. He ended up right there in Rome. And the apostles were going to the entire world. We don't get to see all the details of where they went. At least we don't see them in the Bible. But we know they saw their goal or mission in terms of the entire world, just as they were told in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe, verse 20, all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of, of the age. Amen. So, he is, you know, charging the disciples here. The, this only contains the idea of the eternal being with them. So, this is a very important point. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall inherit, you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So Paul, you know, here we have the instruction given to the disciples by Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul came later on, he was not the original disciple, so he was instructed straight by Jesus from Jesus Christ when he was on the third heaven in vision. But what we have read just now in verse 8 unfolds throughout the book of Acts as it goes forward. That, you know, we'll have the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll be witnesses to Jesus Christ in all Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the world, to the ends of the earth. And this is a very important point for us because, you know, Jesus Christ was empowering them to do his work. He was inviting them to share in his power, but to share in his power, you know, the way in which he used power it must be done god's way because it is a covenant relationship brethren the apostles did not work they didn't you know work they didn't accomplish what they should have and they did not the work that they did because they were in a covenant relationship with the father and his son jesus christ and they realized that the father and the son were the ones who set the parameters for how things were to be done that's why they did the work they did. 
and it wasn't left to human understanding and they were you know empowered by that now God's law is given to us to learn to care for one another to be driven by care for one another and followers of Jesus Christ can be empowered in their lives as they learn to love God and love their neighbor as themselves without that focus any attempt to change human relationships rather than any attempt is in vain part of the challenge for us today is to capture sight of what the apostles saw and to have that some that, that same invigorating invigoration towards the preaching of the gospel and seeing humanity for what it really is destroyed and cut off in need of saving now indeed the preaching of the gospel needs to be driven by our concern for other people our concern for our creator and a desire to serve to serve creator with all of all of our hearts and all our minds and to love our neighbors as ourselves so both the book of joshua and the book of acts they provide us with great examples of various lessons that are very important for us courage the presence of the eternal god his willingness to be with us in the task that we face and the importance of faith in our lives now Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews that without faith, I'm sure you know that, that scripture, without faith it is impossible to please God. We have to be indeed people of faith if we are going to please God. The aspects of purity, sin, seeing this world for what it is, as being ultimately the eternals, and the fact that it is to be redeemed back from the current landlord are all very important for us to remember. This world must be placed under the control of its rightful owner for the benefit of all inhabitants. Above all else, we have to see ourselves as people who have received the covenant of God. And therefore our responsibility and our responsibilities and our actions are to be governed by that covenant, not by our own will or our own desires.